Welcome back ladies and gentlemen, in this video it is just going to be a response to Fareed Responds. A response to Fareed Responds. He made a video, and it was a short one, it was just 8 or so minutes long, where he tried to discredit the Islamic dilemma. He tried to say, the Islamic dilemma is nothing that Muslims should be worried about. You know, don't worry Muslims, just look away, nothing to see here, nothing to see here at all. Well the truth is the total opposite. The Islamic dilemma demonstrates using Islamic sources from an Islamic paradigm that Islam fundamentally self-destructs. It contradicts itself at a fundamental basis in the Quran and the traditions and the tafsirs. They are all incompatible with the central themes made in the Quran. Now spoiler alert, Farid actually didn't bother to make the case for the Islamic dilemma. He simply summarized it in a caricature way and then proceeded to say that it isn't worth addressing and then he showed some random like short from some guy that made a point that's meant to be related. Um, kind of cryptic really, Farid, more than anything else, but hey, I'm here to set the record straight. I'm here to show you the case for the Islamic dilemma and why the Islamic dilemma makes sense and why it demonstrates that Muhammad is not a prophet and the Quran is not revelation. Let's get to it. For those that are not aware uh, regards to what the Islamic dilemma is, it's the claim that the author of the Quran claims that the Bible is authoritative and preserved. Mm, not necessarily, Farid. You can make a very much simpler and um, base argument that simply says that the scriptures that are explicitly mentioned in the Quran are the ones by which it confirms as inspired, preserved, and authoritative. So for example, when I make my case, I'm pretty clear that I'm referring to the Torah and the Injil. Now it's possible that the Torah could refer to all of the books of the Old Testament, as some Islamic scholars believe, or it could just be the first five books of what we now consider the Pentateuch. The reason why I bring this up is because a lot of Muslims use this as a weasel word to try to get out of the argument. And I think this is kind of what Farid is alluding to here, and I think he has done this in past videos as well. He will say, ah, look, they think it's the exact same Bible, and by Bible they're referring to the complete set of books that we consider to be scripture. The issue with that is for the Islamic dilemma to work, it doesn't need to affirm the entirety of the Bible as we understand it today, or even back then. Rather, it merely needs to affirm significant portions of it that are contradictory with the Qur'an, which, without any shadow of a doubt, it obviously does. Now, while there is debate, both among Islamic scholars and non-Islamic scholars, about exactly how much of the Bible is being referred to here in the Qur'an, we can at least put it at its base level of the Injil, which is the gospel that the Christians had at the time of Muhammad, and the Torah, which is the laws of Moses as held at the time of Muhammad. Of course, the claim that the Qur'an affirms the authority and the preservation of the Bible is nonsense. However, there are people that claim this. And unfortunately, they're the most popular critics of Islam. And to them, this is actually their favorite argument. You're right, Farid. It is one of the most popular arguments that people who are critical of Islam make against Islam. And it's because it's effective. And it's because it's probably one of the most self-evident arguments. And we know this because at places like Speaker's Corner, me and others here, Muslims, come and tell us that they have either difficulty with this or that they have left Islam because of arguments like this. So yes, you got us there. It is indeed a popular argument. Of course, now, I'm sure some of you are asking, Farid, if it's the dumbest argument against Islam, then why are you making a video about it in the first place? Now that is a very good question, Farid. Could it perhaps be because a significant amount of your Muslim audience has questions about the Islamic dilemma, and they're hoping that you can answer them as someone who is a person of knowledge on this issue, who makes content addressing these issues, can you finally nip it in the bud, just get rid of this Islamic dilemma and demonstrate once and for all that there's nothing to worry about and it doesn't threaten your faith in any way whatsoever. That's why I think you're making this video, Farid. Now according to the brilliant minds of the Christian apologists, Muhammad, peace be upon him, invented this new religion. He went to the Christians and he told them, listen, um, I believe in Jesus as a prophet, he's not a deity, and you people are going to go to hell. Uh, however, at the same time, according to them, he's affirming their books as divine revelation, despite having no idea what's in those books. Yes, Farid. Very, very simple. Let's dive into it. So the Quran contains many verses that make it absolutely clear that it confirms the previous scriptures that were sent from Allah to the Jews and the Christians, the people of the book. 
There is no contention here. Islamic scholars accept that the people of the book are the Jews and the Christians at the time of Muhammad. So that would be the 7th century. Let's have a look at some of the verses that are given that argue for the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Injil and Torah. Let's go. Okay, let's start with Surah al Baqarah, Ayah 4. So very early on into the Quran. And who believe in what has been revealed to you, O Muhammad, and what has been revealed before you and of the hereafter, they are certain. So at the time of Muhammad, there was a group of people who believed both in the Quran and in the prior books. The prior books would have been the Injil and the Torah that they had at Muhammad's time. Let's go to same chapter, verse 41. And believe in what I have sent down, confirming that which is already with you, and be not the first to disbelieve in it. Huh. Interesting. So Muhammad, in his time, is telling people to believe in what he's revealing as it confirms what is already with them. What is with them? The Injil and the Torah. Let's read again, same chapter. We're still in the second chapter of the Quran. Let's read verse 89. And when there came to them a book, i.e. the Quran, from Allah confirming that which was with them. Again, interesting. A Quran, a book, came to Muhammad. It came to the people of Arabia that confirmed what was with them. The Quran seems to be making a very central argument that you can believe in the Quran and Muhammad as a prophet because what he is saying has already been given to you before and he is just confirming it. If he's confirming it as inspiration that came from Allah beforehand, then that's the inspiration aspect affirmed. If it's already there with them at the time of Muhammad, then it must have been preserved up until the time of Muhammad. So that's the preserved aspect done. And if this was already around with them as inspired, preserved scriptures from Allah before Muhammad came, then it must have also have been authoritative up until the time of Muhammad. Inspired, preserved, authoritative all three. Let's go on to our next verse. This is verse 91. And when it is said to them, believe in what Allah was revealed, they say, we believe only in what was revealed to us. And they disbelieve in what came after it. While it is the truth confirming that which is with them. Ah, so once again, the Quran in the same chapter is making it absolutely clear that the Quran is confirming that which is with the Christians and Jews. Right. Okay. Nice one for it. This is going brilliantly. Let's have a look at same chapter, verse 1 to 1. Those to whom we have given the book recite it with its true recital. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who, who was given the, the book? It was the Christians and the Jews? They recite it with its true recital. Interesting. They are the ones who believe in it. But wait, are there just like more blanket statements that we can appeal to that show that the inspiration, preservation, authority of the Injil and the Torah is mentioned in the Quran? Yes. Finally, we get to the next chapter. So Al-Imran, Ayah 3. He has sent down to you, O Muhammad, the book in truth, confirming what was before it. And he revealed the Torah and the Gospel. So yes, the Torah and the Gospel are from Allah. They are inspired. They are around at the time of Muhammad and they are still authoritative. Like I said in my last video, we also know that the Torah could not have been corrupt prior to Isa. We know this because of Surah al Imran Ayah 50. And I have come confirming what was before me of the Torah. Isa confirmed what was before him at his time. He didn't go around saying it was corrupted. If he did, show me the proof for read. You can't because there is none. And then of course, there are all the awkward statements where it seems impossible to not think of the Torah as authoritative at the time of Muhammad. Like so Al-Maida, Ayah 43. But how is it that they come to you for judgment while they have the Torah? Who has the Torah? We can look at the tafsirs. They say it's the Jews at the time of Muhammad. In which is the judgment of Allah. So the judgment of Allah or the laws or commandments of Allah, which the rabbinic Jews at the time would have considered to be the 613 mitzvah of the Torah, which do include statements that say that Yahweh or Hashem is the father of the Jews. Those same judgments are valid because they are already in the Torah at the time of Muhammad, and Muhammad validates them. In fact, even according to tafsir of this particular story, Muhammad doesn't actually give judgment because they already have the Torah to judge from, and they wouldn't have listened to him anyway because they're just looking for an excuse not to follow the Torah. Are you noticing a recurring theme here? They had the Torah. They could have followed the Torah. And then just a few verses later, in verse 46, we read, And we sent following in their footsteps Jesus the Son of Mary, confirming that which came before him in the Torah. Isa has given a 100% stamp of approval on the Torah that came at his time. Brilliant stuff. Unfortunately for you, Farid, all the manuscript evidence points to the fact that it has the same fundamental meaning as the Torah we have today, which contradicts the Quran. For example, this would be the Dead Sea Scrolls that predate Jesus by potentially one to three centuries, along with the Greek Septuagint, which again is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, which also affirms the same meaning preserved in the Torah we have today. All of this contradicts the Quran. Next, we get to Surah Al-Maida 47. Let the people of the Gospel, 
hey, that's me. Judge by what Allah has revealed therein. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are the defiantly disobedient. Right, so at the time of Muhammad, I would have had to have been held accountable for following the laws that are mentioned in the gospel. Okay, how could I have done that if the gospel was corrupt? Or if the gospel wasn't in my possession? Kind of sounds like the gospel wasn't corrupt and the gospel was in the Christian's possession at the time of Muhammad. Otherwise, this statement makes God to be either ignorant because he didn't know that Christians couldn't actually follow the gospel and hence he's judging them for something they couldn't actually follow even if they wanted to or it makes God completely well I mean it seems twisted and evil and deceptive because he is perfectly happy judging Christians according to a corrupted book that they themselves wouldn't have known is corrupted. Let's get to 68. Say, O people of the scripture, you are standing on nothing until you uphold the law of the Torah, the gospel, and what has been revealed to you from your Lord. You know, this is just me being maybe a bit pessimistic, but it kind of sounds like the Quran is saying that you need to stand on the Quran, the gospel, and the Torah all at once. I mean, isn't that literally one of the six articles of Iman that you follow? It is embedded in your religion that you have to follow the Torah and the Gospel. You can't get out of that. The Quran tells you you have to because the Quran stands on top of such a thing and says, I confirm that which came before me. And then you get to all the awkward verses where Muhammad is supposedly revealed. So let's go to 7157. Those who follow the Messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written, oh written, that's interesting, in what they have of the Torah and the Gospel. Right, so Muhammad is supposedly mentioned in the Torah and the Gospel that they have have at the time of Muhammad. When we look for this, we don't find it at all. Not only in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, for example with the Injil, but also with all the other Gnostic Gospels. The only exception being the Gospel of Barnabas, which is a 13th, 14th or thereabouts medieval forgery that was manufactured seemingly in Spain to pretend to be a Gospel to affirm this very prophecy. That's correct, Muslims actually made prophecy after the fact to try to interject Muhammad as being mentioned in the Injil. Here's a challenge to you, Farid, very basic. You need to show me where the Injil, or the Torah is, that has Muhammad's description mentioned in it, that also affirms all of the Islamic teachings that are present in the Quran, because otherwise it couldn't possibly be revelation from Allah, could it? You need to show me where this is and how to identify it, either in an oral tradition or in a written tradition that comes from the Christians and the Jews. If you can't show me such a tradition, either in a written text or orally, that goes back to the Jews and the Christians at the time of Muhammad that said these things, that Muhammad was supposedly mentioned as a prophet, for example, his description was found in there, that also agrees with all your Islamic teachings, then you have zero evidence for your claim and all the evidence resides with the Christians and the Jews because we actually know what our scriptures were and we have manuscript and oral tradition to demonstrate it, you are trying to say we actually had a different scripture, you need to produce your evidence and you don't have any, which is why we know your argument is bogus. And just to add the cherry on the top of everything here, I did this in my last video, but I think it's quite important. Here is an entire list of all the verses that make positive claims about the Torah and the Injil as being either inspired, preserved or authoritative. You can look through this and you can just pick some at random and go read them. This is not a minor issue in the Quran, it is a central theme in the Quran. Farid has to go through, in effect, all of these and give an account as to how on earth he can explain what these are talking about. He won't be able to do this, so he'll probably just keep sharing random comedy skits until this Muslim audience is satisfied. So here's my dilemma. Nothing I can write or say or do will be convincing enough to the Christian apologists. Sounds like you're about to do a bit of a cop out here, Farid because they think that this is a brilliant idea and a brilliant argument. So what I had to do is I went to the two greatest experts at dumbing things down in order to get the idea across. Ladies and gents, Dave and Jeff. You know what, Jeff? I think anyone can be a prophet. All you got to do is be confident and speak a bunch of nonsense, in it. Okay. What are your thoughts on this book? Give it here. Doctrine and Covenants. That oh, looks pretty good. Probably a revelation from God. Did you say probably? Well, I mean definitely. Dave, what's your opinion on Joseph Smith? Joseph Smith? He's shameful, a disgrace, and he's a fraudster. Joseph Smith wrote Doctrine and Covenants. Ah, oh, well, how's I supposed to know that? <laughs> What?
In short, Muslims, I would be very suspicious of Muslim apologists who try to brush over things like the Islamic dilemma without giving the actual case to you first, and instead thinking they could just sideswipe it with a nice little comedy short. You deserve better than that. You deserve to actually know some truth and to have something explained to you properly so you can evaluate the evidence for yourself and make your own mind up. Why is it this only comes from one direction? It only comes from non-Muslims who try to give you this information. Whereas in Islam, it's very different. There's a different kind of atmosphere and a different objective to keep you less knowledgeable than you otherwise could be. It's time to hold people like Farid Responds accountable. If he won't give you the argument, then I will. I've noticed some people saying it'd be great if I had a discussion with you, Farid, and I'd absolutely love to. If you'd be willing to have a discussion with me, we could talk about these issues and we could present both our cases as best as we can. Since we've both looked into this in our own personal time as part of our own study, we can present the Islamic dilemma from both perspectives and Muslims can evaluate for their own benefit who has the better case. So let's make that happen, Farid. You can reach me at my email address at chris at speakerscorner at gmail.com. God bless you all. I hope you all have a great day and I'll speak to you in the next one. Take care.